So I'm actually very excited to share this next part with you. Um, this course, which I call Life Jacket, is something that I've worked on over a number of years, and I consider it to be one of my great um, achievements in producing it. And I continue to work on it as an iterative process, and I hope to produce it in many languages, all the languages that I work with at least, as well as to help other practitioners create their own versions of the Life Jacket course because it is so effective. Uh, and it really opens the door to project based language learning in a way that um, is otherwise it's really challenging for teachers because they're really afraid to implement project based language learning when their students have little or no proficiency. They say, well, that's too much to us. It's too hard. So I really heard that concern um, over the years of training teachers. And I decided to create uh, what I think of as sort of a system patch, <laughs> sort of a, an antidote to that problem because it's, fair, it's a fair problem, it's a legitimate problem, but it's one that I don't think should hold us back. So what I felt that we needed was a course that would take someone from an absolute zero level. So the worst case scenario, they know nothing in the language, to a place where they're able to participate in a fully immersive classroom in a short amount of time. And I used as a model for this, my mental model for this is a local immersion school that we have here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where they have two immersion tracks, one for Anishinaabe Ojibwe language and one for Dakota language. So both indigenous languages they enroll children from kindergarten, but they also enroll children later, and they try to use a project-based structure in their classrooms. So this is a perfect example of a place where a natural problem that arises is that, especially if the students enroll after kindergarten, they enroll in second grade or fourth grade or sixth grade, it's a huge challenge to bring them up to the level of proficiency that they need to participate in the classroom with their peers who have been um, with their peers who have been benefiting from immersion for sometimes multiple years. And of course, you have an inherent issue, which is that a few families will be fostering the language at home, and most families will not. So you're asking children to come in to a classroom where there's total immersion. There's not really hardly any bilingual activities, which, which is great, but that means that they're trying to build all their relationships. They're trying to impress their teacher. They're trying to learn how the school works. They're trying to learn not only content, science, math, history, but they're also trying to learn a lot of culture. Um, the school does a really good job of fostering uh, both Ojibwe and Dakota culture by holding powwows, teaching drumming, teaching singing, teaching traditional dances. So you're asking the child to access a ton of information and a ton of really important social relationships without any pre-existing language skills. On top of that, with the two languages we're talking about, um, most children are entering with an L1 that is English, American English. It, which has absolutely nothing in common with either of those languages. They're not Latin languages, they're not European languages, they don't have even heavy, heavy borrowing from English. Essentially, the child is never going to hear a familiar word, almost never. So this is a huge ask. And so it's understandable that teachers immediately feel that immersion will not be possible or that they absolutely must use grammar translation methods for teaching, otherwise the students will be lost. And so teachers immediately begin to make contingencies. Well, I can't really do that because first I have to do this. Well, I could do that if my students were like this, but they're not. Totally understandable. However, taking that approach of making contingencies, relying on grammar translation, abandoning immersion, really decreases the effectiveness of what project-based language learning can be and reintroduces some of those highly ineffective colonial methods of language teaching, which rely on 
memorization, which rely on, um, again, one-to-one -one translation, which rely on rote exercises that kids don't enjoy. So we have multiple counts against us that we lose in multiple ways when we start making those contingency plans. So Life Jacket was my way of creating a solution, like I say, a system patch for that malfunction that's happening. So students are coming in, they aren't familiar with the language and they're being asked to participate in a full immersion classroom that is also project-based, meaning heavy on interaction, heavy on hands-on experiences, heavy on new cultural information, new norms, um, asking them to be highly productive, not just sit quietly and take notes, which is a very different level of demand. This is an awesome challenge, and I was so excited to take this challenge on, and I'm really excited about the results that we've been getting with the first few iterations of Life Jacket that we've been trying. And again, I look forward to trying more iterations. So I want to show you um, a group. Now, now I've, I've made tweaks. As I say, it's an iterative process. I've made tweaks, but I want to show you some footage from the first experimental group with Life Jacket. And so it's important that you know the, the group. We're experimenting with adults here, adult learners, um, which is in some ways, um, you might say, a little unfair because we don't, of course, have to entice them quite as much. They are voluntarily there. They are already language teachers. They generally are interested. So we don't have that initial barrier that we have with kids, which is why am I even listening to you? Why do I even have to pay attention now? Adults are more challenging than kids in the sense that they let their insecurities and their fear of making mistakes hold them back way more. They have all sorts of preconceived notions about what is and is not a link, how a language does and does not work, as well as what is and is not language learning. And they really try to force those pre existing paradigms onto the course, even when the course is explicitly not designed that way. So, a couple of examples of adults being a little harder to work with is that a couple of the participants had pretty big emotional moments, obstacles, where they felt that they could not go on. And they needed to express that and they needed to be heard. And it was to the point where they were so emotional, their affective filter was so high that they felt that they wouldn't be able to participate in the class the next day because they felt stupid, they felt insecure, they felt that they weren't remembering enough. They started telling me, I'm too old, I can't do this. All these things started pouring forth. Um, and they really needed sort of counseling to be able to re-engage in the class. Now, you might say that that is a negative point on the class. I don't think so because of the strength of the outcomes and the long-term enthusiasm that those particular learners maintain. So the learners who had a sort of a crisis um, during the course of, of this uh, life jacket course actually ended up being the most enthusiastic, the most proud of themselves and continue years later to be the most invested in learning, even learning a language which they have no use for in their daily life because they just enjoyed it so much. But what it is, is it's a deeply transformative experience for them as a learner because they have in some cases internalized 40 or 50 years of always learning in a certain way. And of course, they are also language teachers. And so they're really invested in being good at language. <laughs> that That's their thing. That's their whole thing is that they're really good. And so being vulnerable like this, being a learner, um, being asked to learn in a new way, as well as being asked to just not be good at something and keep trying anyway, really tapped into a lot of their insecurities and really kind of put them off, off balance. And that's okay. That's what a transformative experience does. The teacher has to be ready, has to expect that, has to understand what's happening when they see that kind of destabilization or resistance or pushback and not take it personally, not be angry, not judge it as like, well, you're lazy or well, you're being too perfectionist or something, but really help them understand why they're feeling that way and that the fact that they are feeling that way is actually a sign of how effective the course is and a sign of the strength of the course. 
and, and be able to build that relationship in such a way that you encourage them to have patience and keep trying, which then allows them to come around on it and really love it and want to implement it in their own lives, which is what happened. So it's a different experience, but the difference is the strength of it. So we don't want to shy away from the difference. We want to embrace that. But that's, that's something that we generally don't face with kids because kids have fewer years of internalized uh, norms around learning. They have a lot less ego fragility in terms of I have to be the best, I have to be good at it. That occurs with kids, but it's not the norm as it is with adults, especially adults who are language teachers or who go voluntarily enroll in the language. Those are generally the type of people who are very invested in doing well and who see themselves as someone who does well and are therefore really put off counter or experience identity threat when that doesn't seem to be happening for them. And they often need their expectations recalibrated. Um, and, and one important part of recalibrating those expectations with Left Jacket is that perfection is not the goal. That's never the goal. There's no reward for being perfect. Nothing happens when you're perfect. That's not even something that we hope to achieve. What we hope to achieve is willingness to communicate, willingness to try, and a general comprehensibility that we can follow what you're trying to say. We know what you're getting at. There's no expectation that you communicate that with perfection. That's simply not a possible outcome of a short course like this that starts you out at such a low level. So there's a lot of work that goes into adult learners that we don't necessarily experience with child learners. So I think it kind of balances out. And of course, um, this was a convenient setting to test this out. So that was another reason. So I, I want to just give you the context of these. These are all language teachers. They are teachers of the Western Armenian language. So they, they work with an endangered diaspora language, but a very different culture a culture very, very, very akin to European cultures, um, very distant from indigenous American cultures. They are teachers of Western Armenian, but none of them are, well, almost none of them uh, are L1 speakers of Western Armenian. The vast majority are L1 speakers of Argentinian Spanish. A couple are L1 speakers of American English. And there's one who's an L1 speaker of Western Armenian, but masters American English perfectly. Um, so they're already multilingual people, but this is very, very far from their repertoire. And you will hear the use of Spanish a lot in the background uh, because that's a, their sort of default language, comfort language between them. And they are there to be trained on teaching methods. And part of the way that we train them is by asking them to be students and to experience the students, the students' viewpoint on a highly effective course. So that's why we want to embrace all of those feelings that they go through, because the point is to learn what it's like. And another point that you really need to uh, know in order to contextualize what you're seeing is that we did not tell them what language they would be learning they were told that they would be asked to learn an unknown language. And they were told why, that it was to experience being a student, to experience new methods, um, to be able to relate to their students better in terms of the, the stress and the challenge that it is to be asked to communicate in an unknown language. They understood why they were going through this course, but they did not know what language it would be until literally the moment that you see me say, da koron we were, we were going to be speaking Dakota. They probably did not know what I meant at that time. But until that very moment, when they were already in the class and I had already been speaking to them in Dakota for a minute or two, they did not know what language we would be learning. And they had to, uh, many of them asked me at the end of the first session, what say Dakota? I've turned to the video so you don't see that in the first few minutes of the class, I did explain uh, I have a map of Turtle Island, and I did explain this is a North American language. It's from this kind of area. But anyway, since almost none of them are from North America, that doesn't mean a ton to them. But they understood that this is a language from the Americas. 
Um, so I did give a little bit of background on it, but that doesn't really mean anything to them. So they don't know who speaks this language. They've never heard this language before. They don't know what it's called. They had no ability to expect anything from this course. And that's important because I'm going to start out, since we always do backwards planning, we always start from the end. I'm going to start you out by showing you a few minutes of their last day working with this language. Here's the context for this. They were asked by, uh, they, they were at a summer camp. The summer camp is completely Armenian. It's Western Armenian uh, summer camp immersion. So as I said, they are teachers of Western Armenian, but they were being exposed to Dakota in this course and everyone was very curious. The whole summer camp was very curious about what's going on this weird course over here. They're all standing in a circle, what's going on? And so they were invited on the very last day of the camp to give a presentation where they would use the language that they had been learning. Until that day, they had exactly 20 sessions of 45 minutes of language instruction. They had zero other access or exposure to the language. They didn't have any YouTube resources. They didn't have a dictionary. They didn't have any other opportunities to experience or learn the language, except for those 20 sessions of 45 minutes. At the end of those sessions, they were asked to prepare up to one hour of a performance for the camp as a whole. So I'm going to transcribe a little bit for you what happens during that so that you'll understand since um, you'd need a pretty good knowledge of both Armenian culture and the Dakota language to understand what's happening. Um, but I want you to just see it and I ask you to be patient as we just walk through what they did. Um, so they did this essentially on their own. Um, I had actually, I actually had a work conflict and I had to travel. So I actually wasn't even there when they prepared and performed this. They were with two of my Dakota colleagues. Um, Shishoku Duta Joe Bendixson and Wo Okiewi, uh, Katie Blue Bendixson, who did help them when they had questions, but they hadn't been there the whole time, so they didn't know the curriculum like I did. And from the from them telling it, they only asked them a couple of questions. So this is entirely designed by the students, and this is using the language that they learned. What's important to recognize here is that. The scenarios that they that they carry out here, creating a song, acting out a doctor's appointment, doing a rate, they're um, acting out as if it's a television program or a radio program. Um, we did not do any of those scenarios during the 20 lessons. So they've taken the language that they've learned from the 20 lessons and repurposed it into absolutely novel scenarios. Um, and for those of you who don't speak Dakota, while there is an error here and there, they are very clear that when the sound is good, <laughs> there's some video problems. But when the sound is clear, it's very clear what they're saying. It's very clear what is happening in all the skits and in the songs. Um, there's no trouble understanding them. So they communicate clearly in all these various creative scenarios without any help or any preparation to do so after the 20. 45 minute lessons. So I just want you to see the outcomes in that context. And then we're gonna talk about how we got there because how we got there is what's really important for what you can use in your classrooms. Oh. <laughs> One I can Vanessa, 
טלין. about how we get there. So we get there primarily via the four F's of usage-based language acquisition. So I've been talking to you about the F's. I've been talking to you about three F's, four F's, and I want you to see them now, how they can be applied, and that that is how we get such an effective course with such impressive results. So of course, the first two F's are form and function. Form has to do with pronunciation or enunciation of a phrase. Um, it can also be in writing. And function has to do with meaning. What happens when I say this? What, when do I use this and what happens after I use it? And so I want you to take a look at day zero, I called it, which is the exact uh, beginning of the course when they'd never heard of the language before they didn't know what language we were going to study. And this is just a couple of minutes of me welcoming them to the course and it's their very first instruction in the language. I want you to watch how it, uh, it plays out and look for examples of teaching form and teaching function. And then I'm gonna explain that a little bit. Disclaimer here. We were out in a woods setting in the mountains teaching this outside, it was beautiful. We had this lawn and some trees around. And my goal was really to be totally focused for the 45 minutes of each class. And I hooked up the camera as best I could and then I just ignored it the whole time. As a result, you will see that there are some unfortunate camera angles and you're going to get a lot of um, screen time from my behind and that was not intended and I do apologize. I'm not thrilled about it, but the content is important enough that I'm willing to show you the video anyway. Um, and the other thing is, of course, this the mic on the camera picks up the sound pretty good, but unfortunately it also picks up sound from the road, so it's really not a perfect video quality. But the content is important enough that I've decided to use it anyway, so please pardon the technical issues with filming, um, but we were really focused on what we were doing and not focused on the recording of the course, so that's why it is how it is. So enjoy these few minutes. Don't worry if you don't understand what's being said. Just look at how they are getting form, in this case, pronunciation, and how they are getting function. I'm never using a language that they already speak. So how are they knowing what I mean? How are they learning what these chunks of language signify? Yeah. 
that the very first thing that happened in that clip is that as the students started arriving to the area where I was holding the course, they started saying a phrase in Dakota. You may not have recognized it as such, but they started saying a phrase in Dakota. They were saying, 
chapachuita, chapachuita. And this is because before we had begun the course, I had introduced them. You can't see it because of the unfortunate camera angle, but I had introduced them to a little stuffed beaver that I had bought in a local tourist souvenir shop. And he had a, a winter cap on and a little scarf like he's cold. So I had named him Chapa Beaver Chuita, who is cold. And it's quite catchy, right? So they had um, seen him on my desk and they had said, oh, look at Chapa Beaver, what's his name? I said, his name is Chapa Chuita. They had never heard Dakota or heard of Dakota before, but I said, that's his name. And they remembered that. And so the first thing that happens is as they're approaching the area, they start see, they see him and they start saying, Chapa Chuita, Chapa Chuita. So in this way, I've already reloaded a relatively easy to pronounce chunk of Dakota language that has a meaning. In this case, I'm using it as a name, but it has a meaning that they're gonna come back to as they learn about animals and as they learn about being warm, being cold, being tired, et cetera. And it's not important to explain the name right now. It's important that they practice saying it. So they're already practicing a form, Chapa Chuita. And then you notice, that the whole class is oral. There's many reasons why I insist that they stand and that they stand in a circle. There's many reasons for it. But one of the reasons is that we are not going to be writing anything down. I'm going to be pronouncing, you're going to be listening, and then you're going to be pronouncing. And in order to do that, we need to be facing each other. We need to be close enough together. And I'm specifically making them stand to prevent them from pulling out a notebook and pen because we're not going to water down the learning of the form with writing at this stage. It is too early. When they have a lot, a lot of language and they recognize how things are pronounced, they will then, just like they did in their first language, their second language, their third language, learn how to transfer that form that they know into a written form which loses some exactitude. And, and we will do that. But in the beginning, they need to learn a language the way it's naturally learned, which is through oral input. When I allow students to write any time within the 20 sessions, of the, the first 20 sessions of Life Jacket, their pronunciation immediately becomes incorrect because they transcribe what they think they hear and then they leave the classroom and then they look at the transcription and because they have been so programmed in the colonial schooling model where the written word is, is the ultimate authority and they've been so trained to trust their brain on what they read, they trust their own transcription. And what they do is they then use the previous knowledge they have about alphabets to interpret what they have written. And they come back and they start saying things to me like, instead of Champa Chuita, they'd say, Che Pachuta. Well, there are some writing systems in which that is how you would read that transcription. But that is not how it's pronounced. And I do not understand you when you say Che Pachuta. I do not understand that. You've lost a lot of meaning. You, it becomes useless. And so I find that allowing them to transcribe things before they understand how to do so in this language with this point of reference ruins my work. And one of the great victories of Love Jacket is that their pronunciation is so good at the end that they are very, very clear when they speak, even though they are going to, of course, make grammatical errors and not know a lot of words because we've only had 20 sessions. But when they speak, it's going to be clear. And so I confine them to oral input and to oral guided repetition. And in order to make that stick, of course, it's challenging. It's challenging to hear a bunch of new sounds and have to produce it and not have uh, that scaffold or that crutch of writing. So in order to make that stick, I very carefully begin a norm, a classroom norm from the very first day that we repeat things uh, a minimum of four times usually many more times, but I establish that norm that we will be repeating everything. And I also do a key thing, which is that when I give them a long word or a long chunk, I repeat it with emphasis on the end. Because this is very true for me. It's true for many learners. 
and it's true in most languages because languages program our brain. We pay the most attention to the first syllable, to the onset. So we will remember that the word for beaver starts with a ch, but we will forget that it's chapa. Not everyone is like that, but that is the dominant way that people will remember partial information. And so, and so we help that and we help proper pronunciation and proper stress, which is important in all languages, but also it, stress has meaning. It changes the meaning in Dakota, so it's extra important in Dakota. We help that by giving them extra input on the end because they're more likely to retain the beginning, but they're more likely to struggle with the end. So if I were teaching them again the phrase chapa chuita, I would say chapa chuita, chapa chuita, uita, 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 chuita, 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 chapa chuita, chapa chuita, because they need extra practice on that final part and I work my way backwards so that they know where we're going when they start the, the word. If you try this with yourself, you'll see how well it works. When you have a long word or long phrase that's difficult, you really need to know where you're going when you start. And that helps not only pronunciation and fluency, but also make sure you put the stress in the right place. Because otherwise, if you only remember part of the word, you'll stick the stress on there and that might not be where it goes. Might change the meaning. One little blooper that you did see is that when I very first started teaching them, I wanted to teach them to say hello. And so I turned around to say hello and I wanted to teach them repeating and I motioned that they should repeat. Um, and accidentally, I cued them to repeat also the motion. <laughs> so they all turned around and then they all turned back and said, oh, so, which I didn't fully intend, but was a funny little blooper, but showed that they were responding to my gesture that now you're all repeating, you do as I as I do is what you do. Um, and that's good. We want to establish that, establish that from the first minute, but I didn't think through the fact that they would then think they needed to do the motion as well. Not a bad thing. It's better to have them doing the motions than not, um, but it just made me giggle when they all turned around and then they turned back. I said, oh, whoops. And that's okay, that's okay. But it shows that you need to think ahead about what all of your norms are gonna be. What are your signals gonna be? What are you gonna teach them about how to participate in this classroom from the very first instant? Let's talk about how I communicate function. This is a serious challenge because they don't know any of these words. They know literally zero words. They didn't even know what this language was before we started. So there's no use of translation. And of course, there's some cultural variation. That means that some ways of communicating a meaning would not be appropriate, either to the culture that they know about or to the culture that I'm trying to learn. So one example that I give is that um, many times when I've taught French, this is just something that was taught to me when I was little and I've kind of carried it on without thinking. Um, in, in French classes, we've often uh, said he or he and garçon. Now you can immediately see that there's a problem with that. So we'll update it either way. But when I was a kid, we learned fee and garçon, girl, boy. Now, that immediately doesn't work to teach Dakota language because in Dakota culture, both men and women have long hair. So there's nothing feminine about having long hair. It doesn't make any sense. So it couldn't transfer those gestures over. So I came up with Dakota specific gestures to help them understand. At the same time, because they are Dakota specific gestures, I don't know what that means. They don't, they've never seen Dakota people before. So I had to think carefully about how I was going to get that across because one of the first things that I needed to teach them was that women say hello this way and men say hello that way, which of course also doesn't exist in any of the language that, languages that they speak. All the languages that they speak, hello is hello. So it's a whole new concept that they would never have expected me to teach them. And I need to get it across. And I need to get it across in a way that's super clear, but not culturally inappropriate, but also one that we can keep reusing throughout the course because there's going to be multiple um, items throughout the course that women say one way and men say another way. This is something that's going to continue to happen in their learning of Dakota. So what I do is I start out with what is very clear and what they're gonna figure out the quickest, 
which is that I point to myself. They've all learned to say hello, as I have said it, hamitakoye. So I say hamitakoye. They're like, yeah, we know. You just said that. We got that. And then I point to a, a woman and I say hamitakoye. They're like, yeah, another woman, hamitakoye. Until I get to a man and then I say hamitakoye eyeshni. They're like, what? What's going on now? What? What's happening? And I point to him and I say, and I, I exaggerate the voice a little bit. And so now I'm not sure what's going on, but something different happened. So they're paying attention. So I go around the circle. In this case, I only had three men in the classroom. So it quickly became obvious what I was doing because I was pointing to the women saying, and they were like, we get it. We get it. It's women. We get it. Um, but I use the people that they know to help them clearly see that function. And then I translated that into something that we would be able to use as a shorthand, as a gesture, as a, as a cue throughout the rest of the course for the differences between men and women, which is that I taught them these motions, that I taught them that this motion up on your chest and belly area means men, we chashed up, and bending down and making that motion for your ankles means me. Now this of course, doesn't mean anything to them. Why are we, why are we doing this? What is this? So I immediately produced a, a card with a, with a picture printed on it of a woman wearing a ribbon skirt. The woman is wearing a, a ribbon skirt and you clearly see that there are ribbons toward her ankle. And I make the motion again. So now they're putting together, oh, we're doing that motion because that's how Dakota women look. And that's, that means women. And then I show them a picture of a Dakota man with a breastplate and they see that, oh, that's why we're doing that motion. So they've seen the photo and then we translate the photo into the gesture. And then we attach it back to the thing that we understand, which is a, a woman saying hello in the women's way and me making the women's motion, a man saying hello in the man's way and me making the man's motion. So there's a function here that they don't actually even have a word for in the languages that they know. It's not something that they would have expected to learn. It's not how they understand languages to work, but I've already taught it because I've done clear examples from a context that they understand. And then I've shown them a picture that helps them understand why I've customized this to the culture. And then they have a gesture that becomes a shorthand and they continue throughout the 20 lessons to use this when they want to refer to men and to use the ankle ribbons when they want to refer to women. This is something that we can all use. Now, of course, when I'm teaching online, I have to go a different direction because I can't bend over. I don't have that good of visibility. So I tended to use earrings, same process, earrings for, for women, although men also wear earrings, but women are quite known in the Dakota community for wearing lots of fancy earrings. Um, so, so we adjust to what will work in the classroom, but each time taking all of those things into consideration. So this is one way that function was communicated without ever using translation. Another way that function was communicated was by making it so obvious from the situation. So we all understand the context, we all understand the situation, and then teaching the language right at that moment. So an example was, I'm teaching hello, but they're not, they don't have anything to compare it to. So they think it means hello, but they're not quite sure. And what happened was someone, Vivi, she stepped out of the circle and she came back in. And so I took advantage of that to say, hello, and greet her. So they immediately go, oh, this is a greeting. Okay, so now they're sure, right? Because there's a lot of times ambiguity about the function if there's nothing to contrast it with to make sure that that's exactly what you mean. So using an obvious context like that really helps. And if I don't have that naturally occur, then I will create it. I'll create a shared context where they know that that's obviously what's going on. So another example is that I have the picture cards on the ground in the middle of the circle, and I'm pointing at them with my pointing stick because pointing is taboo in Dakota culture, so I'm avoiding that. Um, I'm pointing at them and I'm looking, I'm looking, and they immediately understand, oh, Anka is looking for something. Anka is looking for a certain one. And when I say one that they know, they immediately respond by saying, it's right here, it's right here, it's right here, right? So everybody understood what happened. And that's my time to teach. Where is it? Um, because they, 
it's obvious from the context what I'm about to say. But I had to manufacture that. I had to pick the pictures. I had to teach them the words. I had to print the pictures out. I had to glue them to the cards. I had to lay them in the middle of the circle. I had to make the motion. I had to show them that this is for pointing. So I had to build all of that up. So this is a lot of the plan that goes in to make sure that the function is going to be obvious when I introduce it. And yes, you could wonder a little bit, but after a few more tries, they're going to pin down oh, that that's asking, where is it? Um, and we do and we do multiple rounds like that. Another way to create function clarity is by using known items. So the first example was Chapachuita. They know what Chapachuita is, uh, the stuffed beaver. So I can put ch Chapachuita into sentences and the meaning of the sentence will become clear because they don't, their, their cognitive load is reduced that they don't have to process Chapachuita, they already know that. So if I put Chapachuita down on the ground and then pretend that I'm looking for him and then say Chapachuita duktegyankahe, they immediately understand that means where is Chapachuita. And they respond and I say, they all work. So, convert, so using a known quantity, establishing a few known quantities allows them to then build the pivot schema out that, oh, Chapachuita, when I say Chapachuita Chiapi, they understand Chapachuita is his name. But when I throw him on the ground and I pretend I can't find him, and I say Chapachuita Dukteriankahe, they know Dukteriankahe means where is. And so that allows me to introduce that function. I did that a lot. I create, I also had a stuffed spider and a picture of a spider, and uh, that's called Umptomi, culturally very important. So I use that. And they know after a couple of repetitions that this is unktomi. So as soon as I say unktomi dukteriankahe, they understand that that's unktomi plus where is it? So creating enough shared uh, established items that they don't have to study, they don't need flashcards or anything. I, they've just experienced enough times that it becomes a known quantity and it's, so it's deleted from what they have to calculate. It, it becomes a given. And then again, I manufacture those contexts where using that known quantity, the function will become obvious. So this is really a, a function of design and preparation. There's massive, massive, massive preparation that goes into this to choose what will what, what they will experience and then create those experiences in a very carefully sequenced and scaffolded way, which we'll talk about next. Um, but I know that this is going to become a known quantity. And then I know that I'm going to create X context, this situation, such that this known quantity allows them to understand the next thing that they're going to learn. So that's uh, some of the ways that we create function, even though they've never heard nor heard of this language before, they understand what's happening throughout the first 45 minutes of total immersion. That's a lot to get out of day zero. <laughs> Let's look at day one. So they now they understand that we're going to be learning Dakota language. So now it's our first day of uh, learning some things in Dakota and they're ready to ask some questions and, and expect what they might need to learn. And I've edited the video down so you can see basically what happened throughout the course in a shorter uh, amount of time for this 45 minute session. Look now to see where I am creating frequency and how I am offering feedback only their second day ever hearing this language. So my feedback is going to be very thoughtful and very restricted. I'm not going to be doing a lot of that's wrong. Don't do it that way. Nope, wrong. I can't understand you. What, what are you even trying to say? I'm not going to be doing that. I'm going to be very supportive, but feedback does come in because I really want to establish good class habits, class norms, really want to establish good form. And of course I want to eliminate any confusion about function before we start building on those known quantities. So look at this as an, as an example of how frequency and feedback can be created. Ah, what she's. Ah, 
example let's just make one more note about function another way that you see me creating clarity around the function is that now we're doing interactions do you want this yes i want that here you go thank you and so of course acting them out which is a little hard to see because of limited camera angle but actually physically acting them out as well as using facial expressions that based on their known cultural references make sense to them so looking at something and then saying yeah question face and then them saying anything here you go or them say no and me saying oh right these are familiar and it helps it helps them pin down the function so you heard a burst of laughter when someone went a little too <laughs> a little too enthusiastic on the no which they had learned yes and no so they said he which is also funny because they sort of jumped back and of course kia is also known as a word in karate so we made a little joke about that but they say and then of course we all laugh like wow you're really showing me that no i'm really feeling that no real strongly right now um but the but establishing that norm that we're going to act this out and we're going to make facial expressions that help us understand what's going on is a way of making the function clear and they learn sort of key facial expressions that I purposefully make and I'm, I'm consistent with, like, and, um, and 
or um, I make sure to be consistent with those type of expressions so that that helps to establish the function of this new phrase that I'm introducing, which is So moving into frequency, it should become obvious that <laughs> there's tons of repetition. Will the repetition be boring? Will they complain? This is always the question that I get, the hesitation that I get. And the answer is, yeah, and so what? <laughs> you have to push them. We're trying to do something remarkable here. We're trying to be incredibly effective. We can't be incredibly effective if we don't make ourselves uncomfortable. We can't be incredibly effective by sticking to what we know because what we know doesn't work. So yes, there will be tons of repetition. Yes, they will complain about it. And yes, you're going to insist. The way that I do that, of course, I don't have as many complaints in the beginning is that I establish from the very first day that every chunk that is introduced is going to be repeated. And on the second day, I start to show them that it's going to be repeated four to five times. That's gonna be my norm. As I get older uh, or as I get more advanced, I establish the four times as my norm and I will help them to be patient with it by going, when they're repeating, because I know they get sick of it. I know they get sick of it. And it's really important that the repeating not be my repeating. It's really important that it be choral repeating, that they actually try to say it. Because too often in language classes, the instructor introduces a new chunk and one or two students sort of make a half-hearted attempt to pronounce it. They may or may not nail it. And then the teacher just repeats it. What's being learned there is maybe, maybe, but definitely not production. Production requires production. You have to actually move your muscles. And so that means establishing a class norm that it is not class participation to sit back and say, nope, everyone in the class is moving their mouth and we're saying it. Now we're doing it together. So if you're stumbling, if it's hard, that's okay. We're not gonna hear it. You're gonna hear your neighbors, it's gonna help you. So it's okay to hold back a little bit and listen. That is important. That's extra chances for input. So you're getting input frequency as well as production frequency at the same time because of that norm of choral repetition. It's really the only thing that I crack the whip about. It has to happen. And of course, it happens less frequently as students become capable of stringing long sentences together because we do more just talking. But I remind them of that norm every time a new chunk or a new type of language is introduced and I do my countdown that we're going to be repeating it four times. You can pick another number. I think three is absolutely minimal. I would go more. Again, it's a chance to hear it multiple times as well as it's a chance to repeat it multiple times. So it's really important, even though people feel like a dork. It's okay to feel like a dork because I have removed a bunch of other things that would make you feel bad in this course. For example, there's not going to be a multiple choice exam. You are not going to get a D minus in this course. It is designed so that that doesn't happen. You're not going to be put on the spot asked to memorize a poem or get up there and recite a dialogue or something. I'm not gonna do any of that to you that would have usually caused some anxiety and humiliation. This course is pretty free of anxiety and pretty free of humiliation because we're all doing it together. It's all interactive and you've practiced everything multiple times before you actually do it out on your own before you're put on stage to do it. And so in exchange for that, the choral repetition has to happen. There's a big challenge on Zoom that you cannot hear people when they're talking, uh, multiple people at a time. And so on Zoom, I do have to create the norm that we will be doing four repetitions, but I will be silent during three so that I can hear the maximum of people. So I usually make the motion with my mouth. So I say things like, chapa chuita, chapa chuita. Wash that because they need that, both that input and that production practice. But if I talk, I can't hear them. <laughs> so this is a challenge teaching online. So you see that that's become a norm and that, that, they're, that they already understand on day two that that's going to happen. And I'm going to continue to reinforce that. 
The other way that I create frequency is by very, very carefully planning the pivot schema. So we're going to dig deeper into pivot schema. But I'm planning phrases, essentially an easy way of saying this is that I'm planning phrases that reuse a lot of chunks or reuse the same words and very intentionally plan the course to reuse lots of known quantities each day so that there's only a few chunks that are new, that they make sense, that it's easy to figure out what they are, and then that those reoccur many times. So again, spiraling information through the course that is happening with pivot schema. So things like I teach them unktomi, spider, and then I teach them unktomi ya chihe, and then I teach them unktomi dukter kahe, and then I teach them unktomi washtehe, ki ya unktomi washte shni. So they're very easily able to figure out what's going around Uktomi. And that's how new phrases are also built by using those known quantities, which means that I very carefully sequence the course with phrases that have lots in common so that there's only so much that's new each day. And the function of a chunk of what I'm teaching is always already clear to them so that I have less to clarify each day. This is how I eliminate the need for translation but it's also how I provide lots and lots and lots of frequency. So if on day two, we do do you want the spider? And they mispronounce it or they struggle with the, the form of that, that's fine. We're going to be working with for about six more days. So if they don't get it on day two, they're definitely gonna get it on day five. And one example is that that's a nasal sound. It's hard to pick up on the video as well. So it's Ya chin, ya chin, ya chin. And of course, the first time they hear it, they say ya chi. Ya chi is a different word. That's not the that's not the word. It's a nasal ya chin. So it's important. But they I know they won't pick it up right away. So I create frequency by mixing it back into what we cover each day, using it in pivot schema, that it will keep coming up and then we'll eventually start to pick up on, oh, it's ya chin. Oh. Um, and they do. And by the time they left, they were pronouncing it, the vast majority of them were pronouncing it correctly, the vast majority of the time, without my ever doing an analysis of, oh, Dakota has nasalized sounds, and here's how you transcribe them, and they just start to hear it. Yachin, yachin, oh, okay, I was saying yachi, oh, yachin, oh, okay. Because there has been that frequency, and that it has come up in multiple co constructions, it has come up in multiple chunks, because I've carefully used pivot schema. And finally, let's talk about the fourth F, feedback. How are they getting feedback? So you see me establishing norms here that are going to carry through the entire course, although there will be some new forms of feedback introduced toward the end when they're becoming quite proficient in holding conversations. The feedback that they're getting now is all group. No one is being put on the spot. It's all group. Some of it is immediate and some of it is delayed. And of course, it's all oral because there's no writing being done. Um, and so a lot of what they're getting is in the is in the frequency and the repetition. I'm pointing out something. So I'm saying, they repeat when I say, that's a form of feedback that, hey, I'm hearing something. It's not quite, it's this, pay attention. Um, but no one is being called out. And, and usually I make a fool of myself by doing that. So I will go up real close to them and say, yeah, ching. and they will laugh, of course, because I look and sound ridiculous. And that's fine because it's about me being ridiculous or it's about the language being a crazy hard language. It's not about you said it wrong. That needs to not happen. So we're building that confidence and we're building that spirit of fun. So you hear lots and lots and lots of laughter. Anytime we can find a chance to be goofy, that's fine without distracting them too much. And a lot of the feedback happens that way by making them laugh at me. And then of course the delayed group can also happen that um, after they're done, I can say, mm, I know hope that be. So they learn within a day or two that this means mm, pay attention, mm, listen up. 
anachoptavi. In fact, they got so good at that, although it's a very hard phrase to say and actually contains sounds that don't exist in their other languages, they actually got so good at that that they would, um, when we were in Western Armenian medium settings where no Dakota was happening at all and we were just all sitting together, if anyone was talking or off task, they would look at them and say, anachoptavi, anachoptavi. So they really just like glommed onto that one. But so I, I, when I, I finish an exercise with them, I will say, Anahoptapi. So now they know, oh, a correction is coming, but no one is being pointed out. And again, the focus is on me. And often I will go over to someone after I've given the example, I will go over to someone who's doing it right. And I'll ask them to do it. So the feedback to them is positive. And I say, oh, it's really good. And I'll do a few of those before I start to ask the folks who are struggling more. So they've had lots of chances for frequency, lots of chances for input before they're asked to make the correction themselves. So an example of that is um, saying, so this is again something they did not expect me to teach them they were not wondering about this there's no translation for this really but they are speakers of western armenian american english and argentinian spanish argentinian spanish if you've ever heard is extremely expressive they're a very expressive group and they use lots of those up and downs in their intonation and of course, one thing that's common across all the languages that they know is that questions go up at the end. So it's very easy to create a habit in the classroom that, that we learn that questions go up at the end. The problem is that in Dakota and in Dakota culture, questions don't go up at the end. All sentences go down at the end. Very confusing, very challenging. So I do an exaggerated version of that and point out that this is wrong and that this is right. And I do it a few times to just allow them to just wrap their head around the idea that you're telling me that it's wrong to go up at the end of questions, but that's totally normal. That's true in every language that I know. And I'm saying, right, but in Dakota, 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 and so they have a chance to practice, to process that, like, whoa, this is trippy what you're telling me as well as they get lots of input about it and it's exaggerated. And then we do an exaggerated version together, to try that out. And I keep doing that feedback throughout the course. And then as they get really confident and as I see that they've really built up that willingness to communicate. So 15 days in, 16 days in, when I really see that they're willing to do interactions and they're, they're even outside of class, they're playing games together in Dakota, they're talking to me in Dakota all the time and they're doing good, they're feeling good about how well they can communicate, then I start introducing very gentle, very strategic, very positive individual feedback. So if they come to me and they say, I'll say, and they say, uh, and we laugh, right? So they can take that, but only once a lot of confidence with them. And also that it's something that's very clear. We've talked about it a bunch of times. They super know that. They know that. And I'm just giving that reminder. Harder to take forms of feedback do come in later on, but not in this early in the beginning. So feedback is built in from the beginning that I do corrections. I do exaggerations. I do demonstrations, but it's the group it's often delayed and it's always group and it's always funny or positive and it's always about me making a clown of myself and not about picking out any person who's wrong or nor is it about saying oh i'm really disappointed you all did really bad today the key to getting them to continue in the language is that confidence so the feedback is very much designed to support that confidence so I hope this was a helpful look at the four Fs and how they're applied in the Life Jacket course. We'll dig deeper into a few elements of this in other videos. Um, and of course, the Life Jacket course is a living, growing, iterating experiment. And I would love to work with you on building a Life Jacket course for your language. This is something that I really want 
lots of people to be able to take advantage of, and I'm excited to work on in any context. So if you'd like to build Life Jacket in your language, please let me know and we'll talk about it.